the recording. Oh. I'm going to hand over to Dan, who's the executive director of CDA, which is the data and digital subsidiary of Oil and Gas UK. Dan. Fabulous. Uh, thank you, Fanula, and thank you for the opportunity to talk today. So uh, I, I echo Fanula's recommendation of trying to get involved in the society uh, as a board member. So if you do have an interest in that, talk to Fanula. Uh, James on the board, as am I. So very happy to have informal discussions about uh, how that might work and uh, to see what we might be able to contribute there. But uh, my intent for today's session is to take you through some questions that have been arising from a piece of work we've been doing within CDA but also jointly with some of the, uh, the uh, technology organizations in the, uh, in the UK, UK uh, oil and gas sector. And we've been looking at some of the basic questions around data and digital maturity and how the sector is showing up. Um, that has um, thrown up some <laughs> quite interesting data points, which we will share in more detail when the results of that survey are, are formally published on the 1st of September. But I'd love to take the opportunity through now to now to take you through a few of the questions that the survey arises to see if you agree with where we're going in terms of our conclusions from this and in terms of what you think about uh, how we move forwards. Um, First of which, um, and thinking about uh, uh, steps towards how we can have a more digitalized basin in, in, in the UK. Uh, the first question is, why on earth aren't we there already? Um, if you look at how much money uh, oil and gas companies spend on IT, um, it is a reasonably high percentage of uh, global revenue. So about two, three percent of the average revenue of an oil and gas company goes towards uh, uh, IT spend of one sort or another. Um, and uh, if you consider how much revenue the likes of um, Shell, Total, BP, the majors have, you get a sense of the amount of money that's going into, in, into IT over each year, it's measured in the order of billions of dollars for the larger players. So the question is, given this sort of spend, um, why, first of all, do we not already have a, um, a, a fully digitalized basin? Um, second area is um, the question of uh, collaboration. Um, if uh, so, Oil and Gas UK, our parent organization, has been running a collaboration survey jointly with uh, Deloitte for many, many years. Um, and that survey speaks to this. Um, the work that we've done also speaks to this in terms of organizations reporting that collaboration is a really good thing to do but then also being quite light in terms of examples as to where that collaboration has actually taken place and has actually delivered value so there's questions from a data professional perspective as to what we should be doing around collaboration how do we actually make that happen um, in, in terms of our own um, areas of expertise um, and finally um, we can see the world digitalizing, quote unquote, around us. Um, the question is, where does that leave a data professional? Um, Fanula has touched on these sort of areas in, in previous talks around if you're a if you see yourself as a seismic data manager, a well data manager. Um, and the majority of your activities are around loading those sorts of data types into master data stores. Um, where does that leave you when the uh, entire world is digitalized? All of your data is in OSDU. All of your data is moving around freely through digital APIs and so on. What does that? What do you then do in terms of your job and your prospects and your own personal next step in, in terms of careers? So. Um, Three questions and hopefully get a chance to, to raise them as we go through this. Uh, do pop um, uh, thoughts on those in the chat as we go through. Um, I trust uh, Fanula will keep me honest in terms of uh, time as to where we are. And um, we'll try and make sure we have time to dig into these at the end. So a first theory as to why we are where we are in terms of um, uh, why have we not successfully digitalized um, uh, oil and gas? Uh, my first thought was, yeah, it's the waterfall thing, isn't it? So everybody has been preaching for years now around uh, we need to stop doing waterfalls and we need to start being agile. Um, and there is, I think, truth in that. Um, and Kerry talked about uh, the, the switch from waterfall to agile in his first talk in, in, in this series. And um, th there's a lot of um, good thinking and a lot of um, uh, good evidence in terms of the impact of the waterfall versus agile methodology in terms of how you can effectively make use of um, the digital assets that you have. But 
thinking about this um, uh, a little bit further, I wonder if there's a slightly deeper issue in that the, the entirety of the oil and gas industry is, is set up to think about assets. And it's set up to think about assets that have lifespans of 30 to 40 years, typically. Um, certainly the case back in the 60s and 70s when a lot of this stuff was built. Um, our 30 to 40 year planning horizon now is a little bit different given the energy transition and what's going on there. But I'd argue that the mindset in which we operate is still very much asset focused. When you think about planning, budgeting, cost models, risks, contracts, project economics, project delivery. Uh, the instinct within oil and gas is to say, right, what's your plan? What's your schedule? How are you going to do this? Write it all down. Tell me what you're going to do. And then we'll figure out if, 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 if you're going to do it. And that kind of asset centricity in which all the value is delivered at the end of the project, you finally get a something stuck in the water that produces oil and gas and creates money for you. That kind of asset centricity of thinking is sort of hard coded into the DNA, into the business processes that uh, I would imagine many oil and gas companies are, are still operating in. And because of that hard coding of thought processes, that then crosses over into the IT space, into, into the data space. And um, it, I presume this is still the case. You, you, you try and put together an IT budget, a data project budget for your part of the organization. And you tend to be asked maybe in the June or July, the year before you think you might do your project, what it is you want to do, how much is it going to cost, when is it going to start, when it's going to end, and what the value is going to be. Um, all of that stuff is very, very difficult to, very easy to think about in terms of an asset context, because that's how you do it. But trying to think about that in terms of an IT data digital context is very, very difficult because of the complexity of how we work and the nature of the uncertainties over there. And the other things you see, um, so you, you deliver a, uh, an upgrade to your ERP system, um, might be SAT, might, might be Maxco, might be others that are out there. Um, you have a project which typically takes two or three years. Um, your upgrade is delivered. And then at the end of that, the entire project team goes off and does something else. Um, and then for the next, however long it's gonna be, two years, three years, five years, 10 years, however long you can make it last, your ERP system kind of is, is, is crystallized into a kind of business process limbo in which it's almost impossible to make any changes unless you have a lot of money and a lot of, um, of, of time and effort in order to, to, to move that on. And given ERP systems tend to control and codify a large quantity of very relevant business processes in, in an oil and gas organization, um, figuring out how you can do changes to an ERP system in a manner that is agile rather than in a manner that is inherently waterfall is, I think, still a challenge that's being, being worked on with, within industry. Um, the other aspect of this is the question of responsiveness. So how can you be responsive to business if all of your project spend is allocated 18 months before you're going to spend it? If a business comes up with a really good idea about how they can innovate, how they can save money, is it really the right response to then say, yes, that's lovely, but we're going to come back to you in September of next year, which is finally when we can get around to you. It certainly doesn't feel like the, uh, the, the, the way to be going. Um, and, and all of this is um, is around deferral of value. So I mean, it's, it's typically in a waterfall model, you only get the value of your product at the end of the process. You don't get anything. Um, all you get is cost until the, the final um, uh, asset is delivered at the end of the process. And all around um, the, the, the shift from digital to digitalization is how do you get that value earlier? How do you test that value earlier? How do you ensure that what's being delivered is actually something that's of value and is needed um, rather than finding out three years later that you're actually building the wrong thing and, and you need to start again? So there are, there are examples of uh, how this is different. So um, uh, three years ERP project. Um, so um, there's, there's various stats out there around um, the uh, how you can do this better. We're told that Amazon deploys new code to its website every 11.7 seconds. I imagine it's more than that since we're, wherever this particular factoid came from. But it's certainly a darn sight quicker than doing an update once every three years in terms of, of, of a waterfall process. And there's certainly elements of that in the shift from data to, to digital. Um, but the other aspect of this, which hadn't really come across until we started to think about this much more, more deeply, is that you, 
<laughs> it's a whole different style of emotion you get when you are working in an agile manner than when you're working in, in, in a waterfall manner. Um, I'm not sure if my agility dog friend there is quite the right example for how to communicate this, but it sure does feel different. Um, I've worked in project teams for um, over the past 10 or 20 years where we just naturally delivered things in a cycle of one week, two week sprints, because it's a way to build something, test something, make sure that it's something that delivers value and delivers what you want. And you can have that interactivity and that exchange change with whoever you're building it for, which makes sure you deliver something right. Uh, we had an example in CDA a couple of weeks ago. We were doing some work uh, in data processing. It turned out the particular Azure, ser Azure server that we had wasn't quite the right spec for what we needed. So our admin came in, clicked a couple of buttons, and about 15 seconds later, that server was rebuilt to the right spec. Um, we didn't have to fill in a business case or go through procurement or contracts or provisioning or change windows or anything like that. We just had to <laughs> Make sure our credit card details were entered correctly and just click a button and off it went. And in terms of the emotional impact that has around being able to work in a way that is fun, it's satisfying, it delivers. There's still admin in there in terms of forms and spreadsheets and other things that you have to do in order to get, get, get work done. But this is an attractive way to work. And it's a way of work that attracts people into the, uh, in, in, into the industry. Or if you're not doing it, then I'd argue that it probably detracts from industry and is, leaves them to go work somewhere else where the, uh, the reward cycle is somewhat shorter than uh, a typical three-year ERP project upgrade. So the sense of fun you get out of digitalizing is, uh, is, is certainly a part of this. So questions arising from this piece. One is, um, do you see the characterization of oil and gas as uh, the asset, asset mindset? Do you think that's real? Do you think that's right? Um, or is there something else going on that typically leaves the oil and gas sector at the bottom of digital maturity indexes. Um, we had a look at, uh, Deloitte have one in terms of their digital maturity index and uh, oil and gas is bang at the bottom. And the others in, in, in second bottom and third bottom are other asset heavy industries around construction and so on. So we're wondering if, if they have a similar issue to us in terms of how they think about things. Second is, do you see this, uh, my characterization of the difference between data and digitalization? Um, we struggled a bit in the definition of those words. So do you, do you agree that digitalization is, um, is, there's the agility element of it, but there's also the emotional element of it as well in terms of being able to get the excitement of delivery to be able to keep up with the business process rather than having to wait for um, years and years to be able to, uh, to make changes on behalf of your business. So I'd love to hear your, your feedback on that. Um, the next area I'm going to touch on is the question of collaboration and again what that looks like and what that feels like in, in our industry. Um, you can start off with trying to imagine collaboration as a lovely picture of, of a city at night. I'm sure you can guess which, uh, which city that is. And you can see there's, 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 there's areas where everything is deeply connected. You can see intensity of, of flow of people, of traffic and whatever it is. You can imagine there's information traveling around very effectively in terms of uh, in, in terms of how it flows. Um, but you can also see that there's pools of light out there in the darkness and uh, these areas still remaining waiting to be connected to the organization uh, in terms of how data and information flow. Um, for many, many years in conferences, we've, we've quoted the figure that geoscientists spend 70% or so of their time looking for the data that they need in order to, to do their work. Um, the, the survey work we've been doing with, um, with uh, OGTC and others um, suggests that we've actually made some progress on that now. Uh, we got back stats that roughly two thirds of organizations are now reporting that they have the information they need to do the work they need when they want that information to, uh, to, to be at hand. So we've come a long way from the, um, the, the concerns of spending 70% of time looking for data. Um, the sense that the data is now there is very, very strong. Uh, predominantly, the data is there to feed dashboards and analytical tool sets. And um, these seem to be areas where there is the most significant investment across the board in terms of extracting value from data. And that seems to have also had some impact in terms of the foundations of, uh, of uh, 
of data processing and data infrastructure within organizations as well. So a lot of progress has been made in that area. And that certainly helps us in terms of how we can collaborate internally with data um, and how we can move data around. But I'd argue that's, that's just the first step because if you zoom out ever so slightly, um, organizations again start to just appear as individual blobs of light, otherwise in a, in a sea of darkness. And you can see the um, some organizations again more effectively connected to others across the supply chain in terms of how they share information, but um, much less efficiently and much less um, effectively than within an organization. Um, the numbers we got from the survey suggested that the level of trust for data within an organization is now getting pretty high, but the level of trust of data received from another organization into your own is still very, very low. So there are questions for us as data professionals around how we can build effective collaboration by the exchange of structured information between organizations up and down and across the supply chain so that we can work um, digital collaboration more effectively. Um, we had a, th a few thoughts in this work about what is the business model for digital collaboration. Again, looking for examples of where this works, very, very thin on the ground. Um, we'd argue that um, OSTU is probably one very good example where there's a lot of collaboration going on, but perhaps only because Shell is, has shown quite remarkable leadership in terms of what they've done there. Um, you could argue in Norway that um, Equinor has shown a similar position of leadership in a lot of areas through their history of, of being the state oil company and, and hence being involved in pretty much all activity that's out there. And they've had organizations like Epim that have helped in, in, in order to solidify and codify and structure that kind of digital collaboration. In the UK, we don't really see a clear leader for driving digital collaboration. And if you look at the main digital collaboration projects, so CDA's uh, old UK oil and gas data, um, things like the flight share system Vantage, they were set up in the late 90s um, uh, as the age of uh, UK um, national oil companies and, and, and uh, the, uh, the uh, prevalence of a few large operators was starting to come to an end. So our question here is, uh, can you think of examples of successful collaboration that didn't have a clear leading organization or body that was driving them? Um, is it that leadership aspect that's required in order to make digital collaboration um, work? And if so, how do we then position ourselves as data professionals in order to move the question of digital collaboration forwards? Um, certainly we think um, there's roles for the main in leading industry organizations in this, but we're gonna we'll certainly plan to share a bit more on that as part of the formal launch of this work in, in September time. Um, thinking about data professionals though, um, the role of data professionals does appear to be changing. Uh, digitalization has been um, making progress in industry, but um, the majority of digitalization uh, projects have only been up and running for the past two or three years. So it's certainly um, um, not all over by, by any means. And we reckon there's still perhaps a third of organizations out there don't yet have a digital strategy. So if you're working for an organization that doesn't have a digital strategy, then clearly there's an opportunity to get in there, get behind one, try and then figure out what your role will be in that organization as it starts to make more nimble, more agile, more effective active use of the digital capabilities that are out there. And certainly as we see the roles of data professionals evolving, moving on from focusing on the traditional role of a data manager to load and curate data, to being able to work with that data, to extract value from that data, getting familiar with um, the tools of agile data practice, I think so Python, Jupyter Notebooks, all the various RESTful APIs that are springing up around OSTU and in other areas that let you deliver in days and weeks what might otherwise take uh, more formal standards processes months and years in order to make progress on. Um, my sense is that it's now becoming important 
for um, data professionals to become familiar with that area because of the rate of change that's now being being seen in the uh, as a consequence of digitalization the, the capability the fluency the ability to work with and extract value from data uh, seems to be leading in terms of provenant, uh, in prominence in terms of the work that we do um, as opposed to simply the ability to be able to um, to loads of the traditional data types that we've talked about. Clearly that's still gonna be needed, but uh, back to where I came in, once everything is an OSDU um, and all of our data has been loaded and all of our new data is just handed off digitally from A to B, um, we need to seriously consider what then do we do and how do we add value as, uh, as data professionals in that area? So uh, uh, the final question in this area, how is digitalization changing your role as a data professional? What have you seen so far? Do you agree with what I've been saying? Um, how do you see your role moving forwards? Um, I think it's pretty clear that um, we, uh, we see some transformation on the go. Um, there's, there's a Henry Ford saying that popped up. We think it's stuck on a wall in a crystal building somewhere. It says, um, if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always got. Um, and that's certainly the antithesis of the digitalization agenda. And it's certainly, I think, a, a, a red flag being waved at us in terms of the nature of the role and practice of, of data professionals in industry. Um, the other Henry Ford quote that pops up is that uh, if uh, if he was asked when he was building his cars what, what his customers needed, they would have said they needed faster horses. And, um, and it's that sense of transformation from where we have been to where we're going and what that then means for uh, the roles that we have suggests that relying on the can, relying on our bias towards normalcy towards depending on what we're currently doing to continue for the for the, the disabled future is probably no longer a safe place to be so uh, Five minutes so, left, oh uh, thank you very much Vanula. so on that note um uh, you'll be pleased for Vanula to say that's actually all i was going to have i was going to turn it over now to questions in terms of do you agree with the uh, the questions I've been asking? What do you think? Um, can we start the debate? Vanula, how are we doing? Perfect, excellent timing. I'm, I'm gonna abuse my position and jump in with my question first. <laughs> um, you mentioned the, the joy of rolling out things and using uh, sprint, um, sprint methodologies. What do you feel about the joy of receiving things with a business and getting them on board with things being rolled out that frequently as opposed to, you can be familiar with everything um, for a three year period and don't worry about it changing in that time. That sounds like a question of how do you deal with constant gradual change. Uh, I mean, um, there's, there's, there's examples from the from the other world. I mean, we don't worry too much, although I was griping a bit at the start of this call about the fact that all of my buttons have moved around in Teams again. Um, I'm not complaining that uh, Teams has been evolving over the past three or four months as it comes to COVID at an incredibly rapid pace. I'm actually enjoying the new functionality that's out there and learning to adjust in terms of things being not quite exactly how they were, but still with a sense of gradual and incremental change, still being able to cope in terms of how things move forwards. Um, I think we see as a consequence of digitalization an increase in the base level of digital fluency that everybody needs in terms of how they work. Uh, but, uh, but, it, but in terms of the emotion of being told by your supporting functions, you can have something in a few weeks rather than being told you have to wait until September of the coming year. Um, I've been on the other side of the wrong, the wrong kinds of those conversations. And I'm certainly very keen not to experience those negative emotions in terms of uh, saying you can't have it. Um, I think having a data and digital function that is supportive and able to work with the business at their speed in order order to support them is something that's really, really needed now. Thank you. I was going to say, there's, um, there's no questions at the moment on the chat, unless um, anybody would like to put something in. Or maybe raise your hand to tell us raise you're your still hand. typing yeah. it. <laughs> I would be alarmed if everybody agreed with me. Does everybody agree with Dan? Uh, Emmanuel. Yeah, so hi, um, thanks um, Dan for the uh, wonderful uh, presentation, thought provoking question. So I just have, just to hear your thoughts on the OSDU. Um, I want to know what do you really think uh, of, of the value 
it would add in general in terms of um, digital collaboration to the oil industry? Is it really the magic bullet we've all been waiting for, so to speak, or would it still require a lot more work to really deliver those hard value or those or deliver the transformation that we are all hoping that it's going to add, you know, going forward in the industry. So just your thoughts on that. Oh, so an, an easy one then. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, um, OSTU has such promise and such potential. Um, the ability to deal with the issue of how do you get the data you need to work with your applications is a fundamental enabler in how you work efficiently digitally. So to be able to put the question aside to how do you get the data into your interpretation program, whatever it might be, um, will be a fabulous capability to have at your disposal. I think the big question with OSDU is how each of the individual organizations that use it will actually deploy it how the uh, the operators, how the, um, um, the various service organizations out there make use of OSTU, contribute to it uh, in order to ensure that it delivers that value and then continue to build on it through the open source elements of OSTU to continue to contribute to it so that the range of data that's in there and the ability to work in a really um, transparent, facile, fluent way with that data continues to increase. Um, so as Ever with any projects, you have to keep it. You know, you, 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 it still needs to make its, its its first release. So I think release three for for uh, OSDU is, is is expected later this year. Uh, but in terms of the potential, in terms of the excitement, in terms of the opportunity it presents, I think there's uh, there's an enormous amount there to to look forward to. And I would encourage you to get to know it and to contribute to it in terms of trying to ensure that as a community, we can uh, make our own contribution to helping it realize its goals. Doesn't look like there are any other hands raised. Oh no, we've got Gareth. Gareth M. Smith just raised his hand and Gareth. Dan. Um, yeah, that was excellent. Yeah, lots of thought-provoking stuff there. Um, not really a question, more an observation, I guess, in our experience of uh, sort of emerging agile. Um, a lot of the work that we do, uh, a lot of the recent work that we do with clients uh, relies on you know new uh, analytics and data science-driven techniques to address all data management problems. And um, when you talk to the clients, they like the idea of that. They like the idea of the principle agile, but when it comes down to it, what they want is a proposal, business analysis, guaranteed outcomes, guaranteed timescales, uh, guaranteed costs, uh, which is you know, absolutely not at all agile. They're not prepared really to, <coughs> to provide the level of input and support through a project that agile requires. They want you to take away, take the problem away and solve it but in a new way. So I think there's a bit of a mismatch there between the emerging new methods around data management and our client's ability to absorb the uncertainty that sits with Agile as well. You know, if we tell them at the beginning, we can't guarantee what we're going to deliver you at the end and we can't tell you how we're going to do it, it doesn't wash very well. I'm just wondering, you know, whether anybody has any thoughts or observations around that. Um, I, I, if I may say, I think that's a, re that's a really, really sharp observation. So uh, the ability to figure out how to do agile across the supply chain in terms of contracts, how risk is managed, how opportunities are managed, how benefits are managed. I think that's symptomatic of the, uh, the distance we still have to go uh, in terms of being able to work more effectively as a, 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 as a joined up supply chain. But Steve, you have your hand up as well. Yeah. And you're on mute. Thank you. I would echo what Gareth just said. I mean, my experience is that Agile is very attractive for some people. Um, there's certain um, people who want to, who don't want things to change. They want things to always be where they, they have always been. And as Gareth says, what, what people, when you say Agile, people think, oh yeah, they're going to rapidly move towards my solution. Well, unfortunately, the flow of data in most oil companies is so complicated that um, any change you make has unexpected consequences somewhere else. And quite often that um, 
that will just annoy somebody in, in another department because of the change you've made. Um, so I think there's a there's definitely uh, there's a lot of stuff um, that you said, like the trust of data and do they have the information they need. The, the type of organisations I've been getting involved in, um, no, they're still they're still having the problem that I, d I trust my department's data, but I don't trust any other department. They're still having the problem that they can't find all the data they need. Now, of course, that might be because those are exactly the type of people that call me in. It's uh, there's a sort of self-selecting mm -hmm. group. Um, and the other thing I would say is I've. I've been a bit reluctant to, to spend too much time looking at the OSDU stuff. Um, I still remember how how enthusiastic Shell were about Open Spirit. But there we go. That may be just oh, um, no, that's that's something to think about. That Open Spirit. Well, and and before that, how enthusiastic they were about uh, Epicenter, um, and before that, how enthusiastic they were about Mercury, and and so on and so forth. Uh, there's, there's a, I mean, there, there is a big difference, and we've, we've, Dan, I know we've talked about this a lot in the past, and uh, for example, when I was doing stuff with, um, with, with the guys uh, when we did the study, um, there's a big difference with the IT guys between the investing in IT uh, as a way of, of trying to reduce your costs. And investing in in data as an opportunity to improve your benefits. Um, and as Gareth said, these things are not without risk. You're you're asking the companies to share some of the risk, and companies really don't like sharing risks with the vendor. They really want to say to the vendor, guarantee that this is going to work, and then we'll buy it. And there's a there's a question that I just want to get covered in the um, from the chat because it's. Tying oh, in with that. For That's the benefit good, yeah. of the recording, I'm going to read out the question. Um, so Isla's saying that it's always been hard just to transfer data between oil companies, what with cybersecurity becoming tighter all the time. The idea of collaboration seems even harder. There are obvious advantages for operators to work together, but they don't work to a cooperation model at the moment. How long do you think till we see the change? So if I can jump in on that one uh, a little bit. Um, uh, my sense is this is not so much about how long before we see the change. I think it's how long do we have left before we become uncompetitive uh, if, if we don't change. Um, uh, there was an example I came across in relation to uh, how supply vessels are managed and how they're pooled uh, in order to uh, improve the efficiency of loading of the supply vessels and how they're utilized in terms of uh, uh, trips to the, the various platforms they're servicing. Um, uh, the anecdote, and I need to get to get the evidence for this, is that in the in, in the Dutch sector, um, the, uh, the operators had put together an effective um, um, supply vessel pooling um, arrangement, which had uh, doubled the amount, uh, so in a like-for-like -like world, had doubled the amount of uh, cargo that could be carried, but had halved the number of vessels that were needed to do it. And if you look at that in terms of cost saved, and you look at that in terms of carbon emissions of supply vessels, you come to a far better place than you would end up in the UKCS, where um, I think such kind of pool Pulling, pulling mechanisms are few and far between. Um, in, in, in terms of the challenges, though, um, and I think and Steve has touched on this as well, we have such a legacy of working in a particular way and managing our risk, managing change, and dealing with how we operate, um, that the, uh, the challenge, I think, now is how do we move on to a world where we are able to make incremental changes, perhaps not at one every 11.7 seconds that Amazon and does, but at somewhat which is a little bit better than the, um, the rate of change you'd otherwise see in the standard DRP systems implementation. So that we have the legacy dealt with, whether that's data legacy, whether that's IT legacy, all the, all the technical debt that is out there that is stopping us having confidence in the making of these changes is getting in the way of how we can effectively work in an agile and digital way. And I think it's a real challenge now to the, um, uh, the, 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 the operators and to the supply chain as to how we work through the debt to 
enable this more productive uh, way of working to, to, to come forwards. Thanks, Dan. There's one other question that's already been submitted. I'm conscious that we've already run over, so we're just going to ask this question and then no more. So if you have other questions, I invite you to ask them on the Slack channel. So Craig has asked in the chat, what effects do you see from the influx of private equity companies who potentially have a different attitude to traditional oil companies? Traditional oil having a long term vision, but private equity having more short term value creation and reselling. Do you see any different attitudes to data governance? Um, I, I, I see a different attitude full stop. Um, and, and I think there's, uh, there's, there's a real question here in terms of the, the fundamental choice in particularly in IT, but in most other sectors as to whether you buy something or whether you build something. Um, the, uh, and then there seem to be two different um, games being played. Uh, if you are a very large operator, we are working multinationally, you have still, I think, fairly deep pockets, then there seems to be quite a focus on being able to build the internal capabilities you need fitting neatly around your own business process in an agile manner in order to um, get exactly what, what it is that you're after. But if, if you're not one of those um, uh, IOCs, then um, I, 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 th 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 there's a different game in town, which is to consider very carefully where the value is in terms of digitalization, and then what kind of partnerships you can put in place in order to get after it, um, knowing that the, um, you're unlikely to want to or be able to afford to hold that capability internally. So Petrofac has a deep partnership with uh, Accenture, for example, uh, in terms of how they're doing a lot of their uh, smart uh, oil field work. Uh, I think Chris Orr has, has published uh, worked with OPEX and a variety of others in terms of particular areas where they have, uh, have worked um, uh, in a particular targeted and focused manner to, to address particular challenges that are getting in the way of either lowering lifting costs or uh, lowering their over, overall um, pro profit um, uh, uh, cost uh, at, at which they uh, they break even. So uh, so yeah, it's 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 a really interesting um, question in terms of what are the tactics that you pursue in this area in order to get the value that you need for the shape and style of organisation that you are. Thank you very much, Dan, and thank you for giving this session. I think it's uh, it's prompted some big questions that we don't necessarily get to get asked in the course of uh, the day job. And I really liked your agile slide of the, <laughs> the talk. <laughs> that was pretty apt. Um, thank you for attending, everyone. Uh, we will release you back to your day jobs now. This recording will be available on the SPDM YouTube channel, but it is ending now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks ever so much.